Today I'm going to talk about setting standards for low energy building. And let's just look at why we might want to build a low energy building. Um, and there's two kinds of reasons. There's intrinsic reasons. So we may want to build a low energy building because we can save money, uh, maybe less heating long term. We may want to be more healthy and a low energy building will be more healthy to live in, nicer temperatures, better air quality. Um, we may want to reduce the environmental impact, have a low carbon building. Uh, these are all intrinsic reasons to build a low energy building, reasons about the building itself. There are also um, what are called extrinsic reasons. Um, these are reasons from outside that we might want to build a low energy building. For example, there may be prizes for making a low energy building. Um, there may be uh, grants, so the government or somebody may give us some money to try and build a low energy building. Uh, there may be tax. Uh, we may pay lower tax if we build a low energy building. Um, or there may be um, a reason by law that you have to build a low energy building. Um, and these are called standards. Um, now, you probably know many standards. You may recognize some of these logos. Um, standards often apply to uh, food, uh, to safety, uh, fire regulations, uh, communication, uh, wood and paper. Um, the standards that we can see here, you probably recognize Bluetooth. Uh, Bluetooth is a communication standard uh, by which two devices can communicate electronically. Um, under that is the FSC, the Forest Forestry Stewardship Council. Uh, you see this on paper or wood products to show that the trees have been managed carefully. Uh, the CE is a um, European standard, uh, which many products have CE written on. This means it follows some European standards. Um, under that is the British standard, uh, what's called a kite mark, uh, which appears on some products in Britain that may, are made to British standards. Uh, many of the European standards um, came from British standards and um, the opposite, of course, is true. And uh, next, JIS is the Japan um, standards. So products in Japan often have the JIS logo. Uh, these are all different kinds of standards. Um, if we want uh, building standards, um, it, we may want some kind of standards for our buildings. Um, just a reminder. Um, 30% uh, of Japanese carbon emissions come from buildings. If Japan is going to reduce its carbon footprint, if it's going to put out less carbon, it needs to do something about buildings. Um, this is a lot of the carbon emissions. And um, so let's just think, if you were the government, imagine you are the Japanese government. You want to reduce carbon emissions from buildings. Uh, maybe you also want people to save money. Maybe you want people to be more healthy. Um, but uh, what can you do? What low energy building standards could you set? Uh, what can you tell builders or building owners to do or to not do? Um, what can you regulate? What can you set standards for? Uh, please um, start by making a list um, and um, if you were the government, so what exactly would you do? Uh, what do you think is the best plan? And um, try and add, add some details. Uh, good luck. Please go away and think about this. What are your standards going to be? Um, so, um, standards then, where were the first 
low energy, where in the world do you think the first low energy building standards were? Um, when did the first low energy building standards come out? And uh, why? Why do you think they came out? Um, that's another thing to think about. Um, the answer, the first low energy building standards uh, were in Scandinavia, um, coming at the end of the 1970s, um, uh, Denmark 1979, what's called BR 77. 77, 1977 was when it was written and 79 was when it came into practice. Um, around the same time was the uh, Svenska Big Norm, the um, Swedish standard from 1980. Um, around the same time in North America, the um, R2000 standard um, came out in Canada. This came out in 1981. Uh, 2000 is not the year. Um, this was a voluntary standard. And in the 1970s, um, various policies came out in the United States for um, energy policies and conservation. Um, the 1970s was a time of the oil shock or two oil shocks uh, when the supply of oil uh, became uncertain due to some problems in the Middle East. Um, this meant in Canada that heating suddenly became very expensive and so people in Canada started to think about reducing their use of energy and building buildings to do that. Um, in California there were standards in 1974, in the US as a whole in 1975. Um, there was an, a National Energy Act in 1978 um, which then the US states uh, would implement or not implement. Um, in fact uh, we just get briefly into politics, um, and um, as you may know, uh, the US has a two-party system, and often one party will head off in one direction, then the other party will come in and go in the opposite direction. Um, and I guess we could look at this as energy democracy against an energy republic. Um, and let me just quote a 1970s US president, um, Jimmy Carter, uh, who was in the president's office. He was in the White House during the oil shocks. Um, and in 1977, he said that conservation is the quickest, cheapest, most practical source of energy. I think this is probably still true. If you want more energy, just use less energy. Um, and here's a picture of uh, Jimmy Carter in the 1970s um, in the White House. And behind him, those are those are solar panels. Uh, now, Carter put solar panels on the White House uh, to produce hot water, I think. Um, soon after. Uh, Ronald Reagan came into the White House and became president, and I think he took off the solar panels. Um, so I could talk more about this, but I'm not going to talk about politics. Um, I'm going to talk about standards. Um, what this meant for standards was that um, in Europe, European energy standards... Uh, were in place from the end of the 70s, the beginning of the 1980s. Uh, there were standards in Canada. Um, the US was different state by state, and of course is a big country. Um, so the types of standards then, we can, when we start to think about energy standards, there are th kind of three different kinds of standard we can use. Um, one of them is called prescriptive. And for a prescriptive standard, you may say, for example, your wall must have a U value of less than 0.13 watts per meter squared Kelvin, for example. 
Um, that's a prescriptive standard telling you, you must do this or you must not do this. Um, another kind of standard is um, what's called performance-based. So, for example, you need to calculate the whole performance, how much energy will your building use, um, and then that must be, the heating load must be less than 15 kilowatt hours per square meter per year, for example. That's a performance-based standard. Um, another kind of standard would be outcome-based. So let's measure how much energy your building uses, and it must use less than 100 kilowatt hours per year per square meter of um, floor space. Uh, now, each of these kinds of standards has good and bad points. Um, the prescriptive standards, the good point is this is definitive. You know exactly we must not use this, so we're not using it. That's great. We must do this, so we're doing it. That's great. Um, they tend to be a bit conservative. Um, and this comes on to the performance-based standards, which are much more flexible. So, for example, in your building, you can decide, well, I'm going to get very good windows, so the walls don't need to be quite so thick. Uh, and you can balance, you can work out how to reach a performance target with some flexibility. Um, of course, to do this, you need calculation, um, which may take a little more time. And um, next, outcomes-based is the most comprehensive. So you know when you've built the building and you're measuring how much energy you use, you know whether you got it right or not. Um, of course, this also needs measurement um, and needs uh, accurate measurement. And also, this may be too late. So if you already built the building and are measuring the energy use, if it's using too much energy, then there's nothing you can do about it. It's now, it's too late. Um, so these, these different kinds of standards, the first building standards were prescriptive. Um, these are Danish uh, U-value standards going starting in BR61 in the 1960s, then into 72 and 77 and 2008. Um, and these are the U-values for outer walls, and the ceilings and the floors and the windows. Um, so you can see the, the standards came down um, on the BR77. They were starting to get um, under 0 0.5, 0 0.2 for the roof and starting with window standards. Um, so these are prescriptive standards. Um, Sweden, this is um, going, the next kind of standard is the performance-based standard, um, and this then is an energy use, so this is an outcome-based standard uh, that dwellings must use um, less than 55 to 75 kilowatts hours per square meter per year. Um, if then, it, whether, whether buildings are dwellings, whether people live there, or they're non, for example, shops or offices, um, there are different standards. Of course, dwellings, people live there the whole time. Whereas if it's an office, you may only be there Monday to Friday, uh, nine in the morning till five in the evening. So the, the um, standards are slightly different. Um, if they're electrically heated also, um, they could be different. Uh, electric heating, they need to use less energy if the heating is electrical. Um, because the electricity needs to come from somewhere. The um, Canadian R2000 standard, this is back in 1981, um, this standard also requires that the builder, the person building the house is licensed, that he knows the standard. Uh, this standard has an energy budget, so there's a total amount of energy that you need to use less than this overall. Um, how you do that depends on calculations. Um, the whole house must be ventilated to reach the Canadian standard. And there are various things you need to choose from. For example, hardwood flooring or 
low emission paint or material conservation so using materials that will save save energy uh, you also need to save water so a, a canadian r2000 building must have low water use um, and it must be inspected independently so your building you need to get someone else to come in and check that your building is meeting this standard um, this is so this is a voluntary standard uh, people who want to build to this standard can build to this standard and then label their building R2000. The standards, the Swedish and Danish standards are for all houses. Um, and in fact, going back just back a page to the um, Swedish standard, I think this is for all, all houses in Sweden. Not just new houses, um, but houses that are there already must be brought up to this energy use or brought down to this energy use. Um, so there are different, again, there are different levels of um, does the standard apply to all buildings? Does it apply to new buildings? Does it apply to all new buildings? Or is it an optional standard that people can use this standard if they want to? Um, uh, the US, as I said, is a big country. Um, these are a different range of, there are different zones so some places in the US um, don't need heating. They just need some cooling in the summer. Some places in the US um, just need some heating in the winter. They don't get so hot and never need cooling. And then there are some places in the middle that need both, that both get too cold in the winter and too hot in the summer. And you can see these um, the regions on the map. As you can imagine, as you go further north, it gets colder and as you go further inland it gets colder so the uh, the coast um, is the west coast is not so cold as as you go inland it gets colder um, so that's the US the United States um the United Kingdom um, which I'm talking about mostly because it's my country um, and in 1965, um, there were standards for walls and roofs, uh, not very high standards. And um, interestingly, the standards for the walls were higher and the roofs were lower. So the roof, um, you, you generally want to have more insulation on your roof than on your walls. Um, because heat goes up so if you have insulation on your roof you lose less heat going up uh, this also the uk is not a warm country um, but if you do have a warm country um, in the summer the sun is hitting down on the roof so if you have more insulation in your roof then it will also protect you from heat overheating in the summer a little um, also, it's it's very easy to add insulation to the roof. It's much easier to add insulation onto the roof going up than the walls going out. Um, going forward, then UK regulations um, have also got stricter, um, and there were regulations on windows from 1990. The first regulations on windows were to limit how many windows you could have. Um, to less than 15% of the floor area. So you can't just build a house just made of glass. Um, and then U values specified from 2002. Um, there is a dwelling emission rate and a target emission rate. Um, so there are calculations you need to do for a building to work out how many how much emissions there are of carbon dioxide and the SAP and S, the standard assessment procedure and the small energy building model so there are calculations there are ways to calculate um, how much energy your building will use and the standard must keep underneath those levels um, also since 2006 air tightness must be tested on UK buildings so there's a standard for how airtight the buildings must be. Um, there was in the early 1980s, at the end of the 1970s, uh, there was a project called Pennyland and um, 
the UK, they built some buildings um, and there were 177 houses which they built to the, they built some of them to the Danish, the new BR77 Danish standards and some of them they built to the UK standards. And then they compared, this was in Milton Keynes um, in the south of England, um, and then they measured over two years, they measured how much energy these two different groups of buildings used. Um, they found that the BR77 buildings, the Danish standards, they used 50% less energy, um, which meant they they cost they were more expensive to make, um, but they used less energy. And after four years, um, the energy use was paid back. So the saving from less energy bills made made up for the cost of the building, um, which is quite good. Um, they found when they were building that the idea of solar gain, so the idea that you if you get sunshine in the winter, bringing extra heat into the house, um, that does bring some extra heat in the house, but not so much. Um, and they also found that in order to get the right heat, you need to put the windows in the right the right place, uh, which was difficult. Um, they also found there was some mould um, in the kitchens and the bathrooms. So places that used water uh, were starting to get problems with mould uh, from condensation. And so ventilation, they realised, is very important, not just insulation. This is a lesson. Uh, many people have learnt this lesson. Um, insulation is great and air tightness is great, but you do need ventilation once you start making things insulated and airtight. Um, so next country to look at then is um, Japan. And Japan also is a big country uh, with a, a big range of different climates going up to the north and Hokkaido and the south and Okinawa. <clears throat> Even within Nagano Prefecture, there's quite a big difference um, between the north of the prefecture and the south of the prefecture. Um, and you can see there are different zones from one to eight in Japan. Um, and there are different, um, uh, these have been converted. I, I like to use kilowatt hours. Uh, this is space heating. So this is how much heating um, is used or should be used in each area over the year to keep warm. Um, there are some standards from um, Heisei 11 and Heisei 25. Um, since, since these times, originally there were only um, six different regions. This has gone up to eight. Uh, this is more information about um, the heat transfer coefficients and what should be used in different regions and different zones. Um, just one thing though about these standards, these standards um, became compulsory for large non-residential buildings from 2017. Um, so until 2017, a lot of these standards for, en for energy um, were not compulsory. Um, and um, this is Kimu Dewanaku Meyasu. So this is more of a recommendation than an actual standard that you must follow. Um, so if you don't meet the standard, there's no problem. Um, rather than this, there's what's called a top runner program. So a program to try and get buildings that perform very well and encourage high performance buildings. Um, what this has meant is, for example, the 1990 building standards um, if we look at how many buildings met the 1999 standards, um, then uh, two years later, only about 35%. Uh, and this, was, this is for um, large non-residential buildings. They got to be over 90% um, about 12 years later. 
Um, residential buildings, um, 10 years later, less than half of residential buildings were meeting these standards from 1999. Um, so we can see that co the compliance has gone up and has gone up for large buildings, um, but it's less than 100%. And for, for some buildings, it's some it's much less for domestic built for people where buildings where people live um the compliance is less than 50 percent most of the time and this is going back to 1999 standards um this is some figures on um how much insulation um and this is uh, this is data from 2012. This is a bit bit old data, but back in 2012, um, 39 percent of buildings of domestic buildings had no insulation at all. Um, only five percent of buildings met the standards of 1999. Um, so there's not much compliance. Um, there are some incentives in Japan and incentives um, indeed in other countries um, there are grants often the government will give money to improve insulation uh, there are sometimes tax breaks um, sometimes if you borrow money from the bank to build a house if you get a loan to build a house in Japan for example if you have a low energy house then you can get a low interest, so you pay less for your loan. Um, some things also seem to be going in the wrong direction. So, for example, Windows used to have um, a value for the glass and as well as the frame. So the frame would have a value and the glass would have a value and the, then the window would have a value because, of course, as we've seen, the, the window is made up of glass and frame. Um, these uh, frame and glass standards have gone and there is now just a, a standard for the window. Um, the window performance in Japan, um, the four star, the, the highest rating on the windows is um, 2.33 watts per square meter Kelvin. Um, meanwhile, in Germany, um, any windows over 1.3 are not allowed so the stand the highest standard the highest standard in japan would not be allowed in a building in germany which has much much stricter standards um there are new standards coming in um 2020 um i was just looking recently at a, a piece of insulation this is um xps um extruded polystyrene this is a, a, a board of insulation um, it's 991 by 182 centimeters this is a board a big big board of insulation and you can see here um, on the left it has a, a value here the uh, netsu dendoritsu the um, thermal conductivity which over here it says it's 0 0.028 watts per meter kelvin um, this sounds familiar over here it says for the the 2022 it will be 0 0.032 um, so i don't think the science or the actual performance of this board is going to change between now and 2022 um, but the number is changing um, and this number is higher um, and I think this is what's called um, the lambda 19 the lambda 1990 and um, this is a value for 90 percent of products and 90 percent probability um, so if we think of a of a polystyrene insulation and what this number actually means, um, we may get some variation. So every board, each product will be slightly different. Um, and there may be an average figure 
but when we get the board and we put this in our house uh, we may have we may be unlucky and have lots of boards which are below the average um, so in Europe they have to show um, the 90 the 90 percent figure so rather than this average figure here they need to show a figure up here and this means that 90 percent of their products will have a better performance than this number so when you're using when you're putting numbers into your calculations you can be 90 percent sure that you're using the right number or that it will do better um, so, so that's why the numbers on the new standards, the, the new standards in Japan are using stricter numbers um, for measuring and calculating the insulation. Um, so uh, we've talked a bit about standards and there are some problems with standards. And one, um, one fundamental problem with any standard is you may intend the standard to be a minimum. So you want people to do better than the standard that you're setting. But what often happens is people will try to reach this standard and this becomes the maximum. So if you tell people the standard is five centimeters of insulation in your wall, lots of people will just put five centimeters of insulation in the wall. Um, of course, 10 centimeters is better, and 10 centimeters may not be much more expensive than five centimeters. Once you're putting insulation into the wall, it won't make a huge difference to the cost to put in a bit more. But often people will say, no, the standard says five centimeters, so we must put five centimeters. So it becomes, um, instead of being a minimum standard that you want people to do at least five centimeters, um, they will do at most five centimeters. Um, another problem that can happen with standards is every few years, the standards change. So they often get, the performance gets better, uh, the U values get lower. So um, people working on building, rather than trying to trying to work to a fixed standard and knowing we must do this let's learn how to do this uh, they're waiting for the standard to change the next time um, and not developing best practices and their best ideas uh, this is called uh, moving goalposts um, the other problem that we get is what's called a performance gap and often the calculated value of energy use is um, a lot different to the actual use. So you may calculate that your, your building is going to use this much energy. And when you build it and start living there, often it uses twice as much. Um, and there's a big, big difference in how much is how much energy is actually used and how the calculations how, how much the calculations say it's going to use. Um, so just um, to look at a quick comparison um, with standards and where countries are with different standards. Um, the UK standards in 2002 um, were at the same level as they were in Sweden in 1980. Um, so the UK has been about 20 years behind Sweden um, for their energy standards. Um, the UK is not particularly or has not been well advanced for energy standards, whereas Sweden, Scandinavia has. Um, and Japan has standards in 2015 were about the same as the UK in 1985. So Japan is, seems to be about 30 years behind the UK. Um, so there is a long way to go for standards and um, I'll talk more next time about a standard called Passive House, uh, which is a, a European standard that we'll talk about next time. Here are some references.